the title of the talk tonight is Living Peace, Finding Our Own Way. It started out being finding our way and then decided it was really finding our own way, finding our personal way, finding our way. I've been very aware uh, uh, of the uh, events in the community and just all of the sort of cooking of agitation that seems to be going on. And so I thought I wanted to um, talk about it a little bit tonight and um, uh, offer uh, some thoughts about our socially engaged practice or not. Um, Some years ago, there was a commercial on television. I mentioned it once before because I thought it was funny. It was a guy in a checkout line at a supermarket, and the clerk asked him, uh, paper or plastic? And he went into this obsessive orgy of indecision about paper or plastic, and you could watch him. I think, what should I buy paper, and about trees, and oil, and what should I do, and the boots? And so, and everybody's standing around waiting for him to make, you know, his decision. And he just, he's just really, really struggling. Paper or plastic, there are benefits to each. I don't know what to do. And um, the gist of the commercial was some decisions are easy. You know, it's like buy our product, and that's an easy decision. But um, it struck me that it, it, it's sort of, uh, maybe it's just me, but it's sort of like that these days, in our, certainly in our community, and maybe even in our world, certainly like that in my inbox, you know, about, you know, what, how, you know, what, how do we respond to all of this? What's, you know, what's mine to do? What, what's needed and what's mine to do? And, we, you know, we could imagine, it, was, it might be a moment where you think, well, maybe just a long retreat, you know, or maybe those monks who go off into the mountains and just kind of seclude themselves away from all of this mayhem and all of this craziness. Or maybe there's a way to somehow do that, you know, for myself. Maybe that's what my spiritual practice is inviting me to discover or to practice or to do. Or we might notice that um, overall my own life is pretty good, you know? If I just kind of hunker down and just sort of keep it fairly narrow, there's no real personal urgency. I'm not a government official responsible for public welfare or making these, you know, political decisions. I can't control the news or the weather. Uh, No one follows me in a store thinking I might steal something. I can live pretty much where I want to. I can get a job or a mortgage pretty much when I want to. My son is generally not threatened when he wears a hoodie or he drives at night. I've not personally been sexually assaulted. No one refuses to make a cake for my own wedding. You know, it's like my life is pretty good and I'm pretty, it's pretty much okay. And that that might be a way of just trying to deal with the paper or plastic question, with this question of overwhelm. I'm reminding of, reminded of the quote in The Hobbit where uh, Bilbo Baggins says, we are plain, quiet folk and have no use for adventures. Nasty, disturbing, uncomfortable things make you late for dinner I can't think what anybody sees in them, you know. And it, it, it can be like that when we kind of look at the news or listen to the news or really just even contemplate what, what is mine to do. And even if we decide that our Dharma practice invites both personal practice and some kind of social action, we still are left in the dilemma of, okay, now what? What do, you know, how, how, do, how do I choose? It's just so overwhelming. The uh, day that I was uh, working on this talk, I just looked at my own uh, email list 
And I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen requests for my presence or engagement. Um, and even tonight, I got another one today that there was something going on tonight. Please, you know, please show up. And your email boxes probably look the same. Huh? That even if you do decide that somehow, you know, our, our practice invites some kind of social engagement, the question of, you know, where to put our energies and how do we, you know, how do we do this can be just completely overwhelming and exhausting. Um, Um, as our uh, group of IMCC teachers and, to, and the board have talked about this a bit, um, we certainly understand that there are lots of differences in the community. A lot of different ideas about, you know, what our practice says or means about social engagement and indeed uh, about what sorts of things we might be engaged in and certainly about how we might engage in them. So there's just, just even right here, if we really kind of inquired of one another, we would find a very large array of diverse opinions about how we might uh, respond to all of that. You know, paper or plastic, you know, a lot of differences here. Um, As I contemplated, you know, I, I kind of had this, a similar kind of problem when I thought about offering a talk on social engagement because I thought of about, you know, 27 different ways of approaching the, the question. Oh, you're going to talk about it this way. Well, you can talk about that. Paper, plastic, what should I do? Should I do? You? you know, so that there are just so many different ways, even from a strictly Buddhist perspective of addressing such a question, all of these questions. And probably by now we're all sort of thinking, gee, I should have gone home when I had the chance. <laughs> um, so how do we consider this? How do we proceed? How do we do this? Um, I wanted to offer, offer a couple of, of uh, uh, I'll call them definitions, maybe more like descriptions. Um, Sally King has a wonderful book entitled Socially Engaged Buddhism. Sally has come and spoken with us at times. She lives over in Harrisonburg and is a Buddhist scholar who does a lot of work on engaged Buddhism. And here's what she calls it, what she says about it. She says, engaged Buddhism engages actively yet nonviolently with the social economic, political, and ecological problems of society. It is not separate from Buddhist spiritua spirituality, but is very much an expression of it, motivated by concern for the welfare of others and as an expression of one's own spiritual practices. Well, that's how she described it. A group of us uh, in our community, in our IMCC community, recently came together to try to cultivate a, a kind of a, a community perspective on social engagement. You know, how, how do we, you know, if we put something on our website, what, you know, what, what do we say? And if people ask us, will, will you as IMCC sponsor this? You know, what, what, what do we use as a, as a guideline? And there were a number of people who, um, who uh, worked on this for, for quite some time. And I wanted to read to you what um, uh, the group put together on socially engaged practice. So this is coming from our own community. And by the way, this, this group of people who worked on this, I'm going to tell you who they are in a minute, um, the group of people that worked on it also had a very, very wide range of views about how, um, first of all, about all of those questions, about um, what socially engaged Buddhism might look like and about what IMCC's activities or engagement or sponsorship might look like. So it was a lovely um, uh, opportunity for people with very different views and very different opinions to come together. But we um, together um, wrote this. 
Through meditation practice, we develop insight into the interconnected nature of being and of all phenomena. We cultivate qualities of the mind, heart, and ethical behavior, which together have the capacity to guide us in skillful response to pain and suffering in ourselves and in the world. For some IMCC members, our solitary meditation leads to the expression of spiritual practice not only in daily life, but also as commitment to wider social action. The goal of all IMCC-sponsored social engagement is to speak and act from wisdom as well as from kindness, compassion, joy in others' goodness, and equanimity with the aim of diminishing suffering for all beings without exception. Our actions, thus, are offerings performed in the spirit of service attempts to concretely express the truths, the truth of universal love and non-separation as articulated in the Buddhist teachings. These actions inevitably provide a mirror that reflects ways in which we achieve or fall short of our aspiration. Thus, they are ongoing teachings from which we learn together to deepen in our spiritual practice. The wonderful thing about this for me is that it started out totally different. It went through several iterations that each were totally different. And we kind of, and we came together with this. I want to tell you who the people are. Some of them are here tonight, some not. Um, Susan Kaufman, would you, Susan, would you stand? Would you? You were part of it. David Albel, who isn't here, but Barbara, his wife is. Julie Convisser isn't here tonight. Anne-Marie Smith isn't here tonight. Cecilia Mills is here tonight. Phil Schrode is here tonight. Bill Detmer is away. Bev Wan is here tonight. Phil DuPont is here tonight. At least he was. I think he may have gone home. And Susan, oh, there's Phil. And, 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 and Susan Stone. You know, yeah, you know Susan Stone. So this is the, the you know this this is the community that came together to really struggle with the inquiry and to produce a basically a position paper for uh, for IMCC. There's no question that the Buddha engaged in socially engaged practice. There's no question about it. Uh, Mahayana Buddhism focuses deeply and direct, directly on his many, many eons of lives. Eons, he said, of lives as a bodhisattva. You know, engaging in care for other beings. Deep care for other beings. His decision to teach at all when he was enlightened was motivated by concern for the freedom of all beings. While at times he went off into the forest to meditate alone, at other times he actively engaged in both political action and in direct service to those in need. Some of you know, you've heard of Susan's books. If you haven't read them yet, you get a, a bit of insight into some of those activities. He counseled rulers and kings on wise choices and proper behavior during sometimes violent political uprisings. He taught about proper and considerate behavior within the family and with teachers, friends, and acquaintances. He gave people advice about financial matters and unethical and unethical ways of earning a livelihood. And he personally nursed a sick disciple whom the monks had abandoned because he was, quote, no longer of use to the community. And he chided the monks for neglecting him. You know, all sorts of ways that the Buddha actively engaged in his world and in his community. This is again from um, 
uh, Sally King, engaged Buddhism is based in a Buddhist worldview and builds its ideas primarily from traditional Buddhist philosophy, ethics, and spirituality with a concern to apply them to the problems facing their societies, motivated by the traditional Buddhist virtue of compassion. And yet it still leaves us with, okay, how, when, where do I respond to all those emails, you know, to all those phone calls, to all those inquiries? What, you know, how, how do I do that? How do I make these decisions? Um, I had that dilemma. I, I'm, a, as you know, a member of the Charlottesville Clergy Collective, along with Susan and Anne-Marie Smith. And um, I had a recent dilemma uh, because I was asked to sign a letter um, to the, um, golly, who was the letter to? Um, it was primarily to the district attorney asking them to drop the charges against DeAndre Harris, the black man who was beaten at the parking garage. And I really struggled with whether or not to sign the letter because of the, the quality of the language. Uh, and I, you know, it's like, what, you know, what do I do? Um, to me, the harsh, the language in the letter was quite harsh and divisive. Um, you know, sort of an us against them kind of thing. And at the same time, in the clergy collective especially, we've been invited to notice the uh, blindness and double standards that so very often are applied to people of color and the kinds of dilemmas that they get into when um, responding to abuse, you know, to uh, histories of abuse um, in ways that may not always be incredibly tidy and, and kind of exactly what our, um, you know, ordinary civil, if you will, civil discourse. There's actually a fair amount of discussion about civil discourse as a way of trying to silence people. Um, so, I, you know, and I am certainly aware uh, through the white awake groups that um, uh, I have been part of over the last quite a number of years, you know, my own personal ignorance around racism or slavery. I went and did the slave walk in Richmond, which was incredibly moving and read the history of slavery in Richmond. And it was like, whoa, I didn't know any of that or a little bit about the history of uh, racism in Charlottesville, it's like, whoa, I didn't know that. You know, I, you know, I d don't know th those, that kind of uh, uh, information, and I didn't know the name of John Henry James, the man who had been lynched. Um, um, I, you know, uh, you know, struggling with the, just the daily fears and indignities of sexual assault society, uh, survivors. Um, and those who are finally coming out more publicly as transgendered or LBGTQ. You know, how do we respond? How, um, you know, when someone who has suffered a lifetime of insults and aggression finally fights back, not always according to my own white middle class idea of what is a perfect, perfectly skillful response. Where do I plant my body, my words, my mind, my support? Not an easy question, you know? Not an easy question, even when we have, you know, these wholesome words as guidance, you know, sort of paper or plastic, you know, what do we do? As you know, the Buddha taught entirely about suffering, its causes, the end of suffering, and the path leading to the end of suffering. Our practice is not some nice abstract concept that invites us to hang prayer flags or put Buddhas in our living room and then congratulate ourselves about, you know, what good Buddhas we are. Um, it really is a very living practice that invites a real serious inquiry into where we put our minds and hearts and bodies. Um, he taught entirely, entirely. Our practice is entirely about suffering, mine, yours, everyone's, its causes, its end. Mm -hmm. 
It's a lived practice. The, the, pr- probably if, if there's one sutta that's the main sutta, of the main teaching of the Buddha, he invites us to focus internally, externally, and both. You know, to cultivate the capacity to see what's happening internally for ourselves, to see what's happening externally, and to see what's both. Um, You might consider, as I continue to talk, maybe a similar dilemma that you may have. Maybe some of these dilemmas aren't so unique to me. Um, You know, a similar, very specific decision that you might wonder about. Maybe even around August 12th. What do do I do with my body that day? (laughs) What matters? And I don't mean that as a rhetorical question, like there's some obvious answer. What matters? The Buddha taught, Yoniso Manasakara, wise attention and wise reflection. What we bring our attention to matters. What we bring our attention to matters. What we actively attend to or acquiesce to will condition what comes after, both for ourselves and others. We practice in meditation, but the practice is for life and indeed for all of a life. So our practice is a mind training to first recognize and then further develop the qualities of mind and heart that then are available to inform our speech and our action for peace in our very intimate world. So consider that for a minute. Hmm. Qualities of mind and heart that then are available to inform our speech, our thinking, first of all, our thinking, our thoughts, as we read the Washington Post, our speech, and our actions for the ending of suffering in our very personal and intimate world. I would propose that that really is the inquiry that we are invited to make daily. What are the qualities of mind and heart that then are available to inform our thinking, our speech, our actions in the service of peace in our very intimate world. Mind training invites us to not pay equal attention to everything and everyone. Where is the mind? Can we notice where the mind is caught in greed, hatred, and ignorance? Where is suffering? Where is its cause? Where and what is wholesome action? For us to consider when we even open our emails or when we even listen to the news or read the Washington Post, um, don't pay equal attention to everything and everyone. Where is the mind, my own or someone else's, hmm, caught in greed, hatred, and ignorance? Is it wholesome to pay attention there? Um, (laughs) You've heard me talk often about refrigerator magnets. There are no refrigerator magnets that we can post on our refrigerator that give us the answer to these questions. Here's what you do. The Buddha asks us to hear the teachings indeed, but he counsels us to go further for those teachings if we hope that they will bear fruit. We have to reflect and deeply contemplate. What is mine to do? How does my practice today inform my thoughts and speech and choices and behavior? 
the how is really the crucial piece, not the what. Because we can do something that appears to be incredibly important, but we can do it in a way, either with a mind full of greed, hatred, or delusion, or in a way that actually you know, contributes to further greed, hatred, and delusion in the world. Or we can stay home and weed our garden with a mind absent greed, hatred, and delusion and actually, in fact, contribute more to world peace. So there isn't really some kind of refrigerator magnet that says, well, you know, if you're really engaged in, you know, if you really have an engaged Buddhist practice, this is what it will look like. There really isn't. The challenge is to reflect and then deeply contemplate what does this mean for me here now on July 31st, 2018. And there really, truly are no suggestions about what it should be. And just as there are no suggestions about what it should be for each of us, um, there are no suggestions um, that might plant themselves in our minds about what it should be for our um, friends or our relatives or our neighbors, you know, how they should be behaving. I was talking uh, last week to a couple of people who, for very, 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 very good reasons, not that I even get a vote about whether or not their reasons are good, but they were very compelling reasons are electing to not engage in the events of August 12th at all. Other people might, for very, very, very good and compelling reasons, choose to engage very actively. It's not up to any of us to decide for anybody else. Lord knows it's hard enough to decide for ourselves. So what what we can practice that is what allows us to stay connected to wise speech, wise livelihood, and wise action, to the Brahma Viharas, loving kindness, deep compassion, joy in others' goodness, equanimity. Those Brahma Viharas that we just spent like five months exploring. Socially engaged Buddhism might be, admi- might be about publicly demonstrating, or it might be about how we care for our invalid parent or our addicted relative, or the homeless person on the street. It might be about our actions, and especially about our minds, when we make the bed and weed our garden and wash the dishes. We have to look and see. Yoniso Manasakara. What do we attend to? Why is attention, and how do we attend to it? It's a real personal inquiry. This is from Tanisaro. He says, if the ways of the mind were simple, its problems would be simple and easy to solve. A single blanket approach to whatever happens in the present, a noble one-fold path. Just mindfulness, just concentration, or just non-reactive awareness. Or the Buddha might not not have bothered to teach much at all, knowing that people could easily solve their problems on their own. Don't bother to teach. It's simple. It's obvious. Even just a few minutes spent observing the ways of the mind can show how complex and convoluted they are. And this means that its problems are complex as well. In particular, the problem of suffering. As the Buddha noted, the causes of suffering are knotted and tangled like a bird's nest like the thread in a tangled skein of yarn. So the energy that's invited is the energy of our own minds and hearts to bring it to bear to these questions. And indeed, maybe the energy to decide paper or plastic and perhaps to have to deal with the judgment of somebody else who thinks you made the wrong choice. It's important to be wise and discerning in what we attend to and how we focus that attention.
This is Tanisaro again. He said, the same principle applies in solving the problem of suffering, which is why the Buddha gave prime importance to the ability to frame the issue of suffering in the proper way. He called this ability yuniso manasakara, appropriate attention, and taught that no other inner quality was more helpful for untangling suffering and gaining release. This is Ajahn Pasano. He's the abbot of Abhayagiri Monastery out in, uh, on the West Coast. He says, we are not talking about forcing or being politically correct. It's not about setting up a set of rules for behavior, still less a set of rules for the mind. We are talking about the Eightfold Path, cultivating wise discernment, wise intention, wise action, wise speech, wise livelihood, wise effort, wise mindfulness, wise concentration. If attention comes from aversion or a force of will, this is right, this and only this is right, this is how it has to be, for me and everybody else. There is a quality of non-acceptance, a forcing, and it leads to discontent, lack of appreciation or gratitude. Everything becomes problematic or difficult. Hmm. Wise attention is attention guided by the question, where is suffering? Hmm. For me, for others, what is its cause? What helps to release that cause, to end the suffering? Or, alternately, where is happiness? Where is peace? What is its cause? What are the conditions that lead to its arising, the arising of happiness and peace? What interferes? How do we cultivate skill with both happiness and peace? It sounds good in the abstract, but the inquiry needs to be very personal and very intimate. This is Tanisaro again. He says, when offering op options for solving a problem, no particular number of options is on principle superior to any other. What matters is that the options are enough to be adequate for the problem but not so many as to obscure its solution and themselves become a tangle. Tanisaro outlines four useful strategies, each requiring thought, reflection, and analysis. The type of thought that one ponders deeply what's happening in the present, both internally and externally. Am I caught in greed? hatred, or ignorance. I think of that often when I'm looking through the Washington Post. I read it online, so it's sort of easy to kind of look at the headlines. You know, why am I reading this? What's the, you know, what's the motive? What's driving my, my interest in this article? In psychological terms, am I caught in fight or flight or freeze? <laughs> am I caught in reactivity? Is my nervous system regulated? Dan Siegel says um, we can't function effectively and skillfully unless we are. We have a nervous system that's flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable. He writes whole books about that. So, um, so the type of thought that ponders deeply what's happening, really inquiring what's happening internally, what's happening externally. The type of thought that questions past understandings and misunderstandings. I talked just a, a moment ago about, uh, just a little bit about my, um, uh, un, in my contemplation over the years of the, my ignorance. And I have just enough understanding after probably about five years of rather avid reading and inquiry and discussions in my wide awake group to know how profoundly ignorant I remain about all sorts of so social suffering and what might be done. Um, so the type of thought that ponders deeply and that questions the things that we think we know to be true. 
It was quite remarkable to read um, the history, uh, some of the history of of uh, racism in Charlottesville, and how enthusiastically the politicians, the university, and the Daily Progress supported active uh, racism. It's really quite remarkable. I didn't know that. Um, Third, the type of analysis that can ferret out connections between actions and their results. That's probably a whole separate talk. But um, the Buddha has a number of suttas. He says, in one of the suttas, he says, you know, um, when I was still just an unawakened uh, uh, bodhisattva, he said, I, the thought occurred to me, why don't I divide my thinking into s- two sorts? And so he kind of started looking at his thinking. Um, you know, thinking in imbued with harmfulness or thinking imbued with letting go. You know, and that if, if there's thinking that somehow is imbued with harmfulness, can I practice, 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 practice. It's not about, you know, giving ourselves black marks like we're not doing it right, but practicing. Can I cultivate a practice of, of letting go of thoughts that are imbued with harmfulness? And then finally, um, can I evaluate thoughts as to whether they're helpful or not? Genuinely helpful in terms of the ending of suffering. You've learned to do this in a million ways as you sit on your cushion. What's useful, what's not? Here's what they said to do. Is this really what I should do right now? You know, you have to make those decisions all the time, don't you? Attending in the moment, being aware, it's like this now. And then we look to see what's helpful, what's not. Where's ease? Where's their tension? We make choices. We make choices all the time. We make choices in our individual practice all the time. This is Tanisaro again. He says, what this means that is that as a meditator, you can't treat everything in the present moment in the same way. You can't simply stay non-reactive or simply accept everything that comes. If moments of stillness and ease arise in the mind, you can't just note that you cannot just note them and let them pass. You should learn to develop them into qualities that form the, that form the heart of the path. When mental suffering arises, you can't just let it go. You should focus whatever powers of concentration and discernment you have to try to comprehend the clinging, the hanging on that lies at the heart of that suffering. You know, our practice offers sturdy supports for peace and for focusing our attention in wholesome ways. Ajahn Pasano says it's about taking responsibility to direct our attention to what helps to settle the mind. It's one of the reasons why the breath is so important because it's intrinsically, it has a very soothing quality and helps to settle the mind. So the inquiry really is, um, what is mind to do? What's happening? What's needed? Where am I internally? What's going on externally? What kind of guidance can I give myself in terms of the how and what is mine to do? And then we make choices and some of the choices are mistakes. And we learn from them. And we cultivate with great kindness and patience our own mistakes and the mistakes of others. And we do our best over time to kind of cultivate um, the ending of suffering. Here's a quote from the lion's roar. Engaged Buddhism is the practice of, of applying the insights gained from meditation and Dharma teachings to alleviating suffering of a social, environmental, or political nature. Thich Nhat Hanh is widely recognized as the original proponent of this form of practice. But as the monk himself said, all Buddhism is engaged. When bombs begin to fall on people, you cannot stay in the meditation hall all of the time. 
Meditation is about the awareness of what is going on, not only in your body and in your feelings, but all around you. So, paper or plastic, no one can decide for you. Nor can we decide for anybody else. It's very personal. There's a line that is uh, from a poem by Dorothy Hunt. She says, do you think peace will come some other place than here? Some other time than now? Some other heart than yours? I think I'll try to think of that when I read the Washington Post tomorrow morning. Thank you.